Mashalom Ka Yasharal, Meshbika. I pray that everybody had a beautiful Shabbat. All right, today is the first day of the week. And as always, we're going to get together with a new scripture, all right, because we have to always make sure that we keep our minds on Torah. Now, the title of today's show is called, Should Weddings Be Bound by Contracts? All right. Again, the title of today's show is called, Should Weddings Be Bound by Contracts? But before we get started, we have to give all praises, respect, and honor to the Father of Yahuwah for sending his ultimate love gift, Yahushua HaMashiach, who was that atoning sacrifice for the nation of Yasharal. All right, I'm going to say it again. Yahushua HaMashiach was that atoning sacrifice for the nation of Yasharal, bringing us back into covenant relationship again with the Father. All right, that is very, very important. And we all should be able to see the function and the purpose of the Messiah through the Moedim, all right? The feast days of Yahuwah. Again, I'm going to say, like I do in all of the shows that I do, Israel, Yasharal, we need a Redeemer in order for us, all right, to be reconnected back to the Father again. That is very important. Now, again, the title of today's show was called Should Weddings Be Bound by Contracts? And the reason why I decided to do this show is because there's a lot of um, things going on um, in the media. When I say the media, I mean Facebook, YouTube, um, Twitter, and just basic one-on-one um, -on -one conversations, all right? Um, there's a lot of men that are, that are teaching that as long as you go into the woman, you're technically married, all right? We want to look into that, all right? We want to make sure that everything is going to line up perfectly with Torah, all right? Everything has to line up perfectly with Torah. And um, in order to understand what I'm saying, you're going to have to leave your Gentile Western mentalities at the door and look at the scriptures from a Hebraic perspective. All right. I'm going to say it again. You must leave your Gentile Western thought patterns at the door. All right. Come clean and let's look at the scriptures from a Hebraic perspective. Now, <clears throat> in order to get um, a better understanding, I'm just going to. Um, Get rid of this here and excuse the, uh, the little cloth that I have here. I'm going to be getting uh, another eraser. The eraser that I had went bad. So just bear with me a little bit. The most important thing that we're going to be doing is making sure that we get a better um, understanding of um, Torah re regarding this topic here. Now, um, the word that we're going to be looking at, all right, that might help us get a better understanding of what's going on is the word um, quadushin. All right, I'm going to spell that. That's Q-A-D-U-S-H-Y-N. Quadushin. All right. Now, I believe that this is the more ancient way of spelling and writing the word. All right, quadushin. Now, it's all you might find the words. You are going to find the word like this too. This same word is spelled this way: K I D D U S H I N. All right. In both of these words here, it just means betrothal. All right. B Betrothal. And betrothal is a part of the marriage ceremony. Okay. Again, the word betrothal is part of the marriage ceremony. You will find this word kedushin um, is more um, hmm, Aramaic. And the reason why I say Aramaic, because with this here, they're going to begin to use um, the vowel point system, the nakuds, and the um, and the Degeshes, that's going to give you basically um, this spelling. But I truly believe that um, from a Hebraic perspective, in the ancient Hebrew, that it would be actually spelled Q-A-D-U-S-H-Y-N, Quadushin. But nevertheless, the word means uh, betrothal. All right. And I believe that this might help us a whole lot in getting a better understanding on um, this topic today. So we're going to go ahead with the show. Again, the title of today's show is called Should Weddings Be Bound by Contracts? 
And the first scripture that we're going to go to is um, Deborah 23, 28. Oh, and there's another thing that I want to bring out to here. Uh, what we also find in this word quadushin is the word quadash, all right, which means to be set apart. So this now ties in back to this word here. A woman that's in the betrothal period of the marriage, all right, she's considered set apart, all right? Again, she's considered set apart. Now we can begin with the scripture. Let's go to the book of Deborah, which is the book of um, Deuteronomy, the 22nd chapter. And we're going to begin with the... Uh, let's see, let's see, let's see. Let's go with the 23rd verse. It says, if a damsel that is a virgin be betrothed, which brings us back to this word here again, quadushin, okay, betrothal. We have the word quadush, In the word quadushin means set apart. If a damsel that is a virgin be betrothed to a husband, she's set apart. And a man find her in the city and lie with her, then you shall bring them, the man and the woman, both out unto the gate of that city, and you shall stone them, the man and the woman, with stones that they die. The damsel, because she cried not, being in the city, and the man, because he hath humbled his neighbor's wife because he has humbled his neighbor's wife. So the point that I'm trying to make here now is that this woman was quadushin. She was in the betrothal part of the marriage. We have the word quadush, means that she was set apart. This woman was not to interact sexually with no other man. She's set apart, all right? It's just that she didn't go through the initial um, intimate part of the relationship to actually consummate it. All right. That's very important for us to understand because what I'm going to be doing here now is be, I'm going to be showing parallels, our earthly marriage versus the spiritual marriage that we have with Yahushua HaMashiach. All right. And we should be able to see the parallels in all of this. I'm going to read on verse 25. But if a man that is betrothed, Excuse me, if a man, excuse me, but if a man find a betrothed damsel in the field and the man force her and lie with her, then the man only that lie with her should die. But unto the damsel thou shalt do nothing. There is, there is in the damsel no sin worthy of death. For as when a man rises against his neighbor and slayeth him, even so is this matter. For he found her in the field, and the betrothed woman cried, and there was none to save her. All right, so we see now here, the woman here is honoring the betrothal part of the marriage. She was raped. She uh, was approached through force. Only the man is going to die. So this woman here, again, she's in the, she's quadouche. She's set apart. And again, I just wanted to bring that out to make sure that everybody gets a, uh, a clear um, understanding of what's going on here. Before you get to the actual marital part of the ceremony, you're in what we call a betrothal period. Your kadush, your kadash, you're set apart. All right. If there's any questions with anything that I just said, leave a message and I can uh, try to define it a little bit better. All right. Now, um, the next scripture that I want to use is uh, the book of Matthew, Yahoo, the book of Matthew, and I'm going to be reading um, chapter 1, verse 8. All right, see verse 18. The book of Matthew. The book of Matthew, the first chapter. Verse 8. Now the birth of Yahushua HaMashiach was on this wise, or this way. When as his mother Miriam was espoused, okay, the word espoused also means betrothed, betrothal. She was in the quadushin part of the marriage, making her set apart. All right, she was set apart to Yosef. Before they uh, came together, she was found with child of the set apart spirit. All right, so we see now here is that Yosef did not have intimate relations with Miriam. 
all right? I've gone through that scripture before, but again, I just want to bring out the fact that she was set apart in the part of the marriage that she was in. She was in the betrothal ceremonial stage of the marriage. She was quidushin. She was set apart. All right. And again, uh, I think I pretty much nailed that. Now, what we want to do now, we just brought out some earthly principles of marriage. So the next thing that we want to do is see how this parallels with Yahushua HaMashiach. And the reason why I want to do this parallel here is because there's an earthly marriage and there's the, um, the marriage that the bride, the nation of Israel, is supposed to be preparing for. And the groom is Yahushua HaMashiach. Let's see how this parallels, all right? Uh, let's go to the book of Ezekiel, Yakaz Kuyal, the 16th chapter, and we're going to start with verse 1, all right? The book of Ezekiel, Yakaz Kuyal, the 16th chapter, and the first verse verse again the word of Yahuwah came into me all right on, the, on Ezekiel saying son of man call Yerushalayim to know her abominations so first we have to ask ourselves why is this um, mission given to Ezekiel to show um, Israel her abominations my argument is going to be this at this particular stage Yasharal was in the betrothal stage of the marriage she was quidushin, all right? She was set apart. Israel committed adultery in this stage of the marriage. In the betrothal stage of the marriage, she committed adultery. Just like I brought out earlier in the book of Deuteronomy, Devarim, the 22nd chapter, and I read 23, and I read, I think, down to like the 25th, the 26th verse. We see now there are consequences even in this stage when the woman goes out with another man and the sentence is death because all intents and purposes again she's considered married even in this stage the betrothal part this quadushin part she set apart son of man caused jerusalem to know her abominations and say thus saith yahuwah elohim into jerusalem jerusalem thy birth and thy nativity is of the land of, of Canaan. Thy father was an Amorite and thy mother an Hittite. So we see here now that the groom is using derogatory terms, okay? Derogatory terms against his bride. He's saying that, listen, you know what? In the day of your nativity, you were a Canaanite. Your mother, what we have, your mother was an Hittite and your father was an Amorite. These are not pleasant terms that the father is using towards his bride all right he's calling her a whore all right the nation of israel has been called a whore here verse four and as for thy nativity in the day that thou was born thy navel was not cut neither was thou washed in water so we see now the importance of water water is talking about a mikvah water is talking about an immersion these are all wedding ceremonial practices all right i'm going to say it again water is a ceremonial marital um process all right that the woman goes through in order to be married just just deems her clean but we have a situation where it says that was not washed in water or suppled thee when i looked upon thee thou was not salted at all nor swaddled at all none i pity thee to do any of these unto thee which is to have compassion on this woman when she was in this state of sin, all right? She was in her own blood. Let me read it again. None I pity thee to do any of these unto thee to have compassion on thee. Now, this also now discredits what the Christians say. The Christians say that mercy and compassion didn't come into the Brit Hadashah. But we have here now that the groom is actually having compassion on the bride, the nation of Yasharal, right here, when he saw the woman, Yasharal, in her own blood, iniquity. This blood is representing iniquity. 
adultery. Verse, verse six. And when I passed by thee and saw thee trodden underfoot or polluted in thy own blood, and that's very important, in thy own blood, and the blood is representing sin, I said unto thee when thou was in thy blood, live. Yes, I said unto thee when thou was in thy blood, live. Verse 6 speaks volumes, all right? Verse 6 speaks volume. And let's look into verse 6 a little bit here, all right? So we again, we can get a clear understanding on what's going on. So we can clearly define whether or not a wedding should be bound by a contract. If it's good enough for Yahushua HaMashiach, the way that it was done in the beginning, it should be good enough for us, all right? It should be good enough for us. Now, verse 6, there's a word that I want to look at, all right, that's going to help us, again, get a better understanding of what's going on, and that word is kaya, all right? The word kaya, the word live. All right, just write that word down here for us. C H A Y A H. All right. And in the uh, in the ancient Hebrew, that would be spelled this way. All right. We have what looks like a ladder. Okay. Excuse my <laughs> my writing here. All right, that's Kaya. Now, when it says now, when I saw you in your own blood and I said live, what I find very interesting in this uh, pictograph here is, first of all, this is the eighth letter of the Hebrew al um, Aleph Bet. The number eight represents new beginning, all right? new beginning so so when we see now the groom saying yaha akaya excuse me kaya he's giving the woman a new lease on life then we have the ya and we know that this represents the right hand and we know who sits on the right hand of the father, which represents um, the groom, Yahushua HaMashiach, and this ha here, or some might say hey here, it just means to behold a witness. So we have here now, if we was to read this now, in this polluted state that the woman was in, the groom says live, giving her a new lease on life, a new beginning, the number eight represents new beginning because we know that the number seven means completion. And after seven comes eight or the number one, which means new beginning. So we so we have the groom looking at this woman in this polluted state. He puts a fence around her. He beholds her and he tells her to live. All right, I'm going to say that again. When the groom saw this woman in this abominable state he put a fence around here because this car represents a fence or a wall he that sits on the right hand side of the father is yahuwah he beheld this woman because this ha or this hey here means to behold he saw this woman in that chaotic state and he gave her um the right to live resurrection all right so if there's any question okay again how I came up with this out of Kaya, which means, which is Haya. Uh, this is Haya, and it just means um, to live. Again, a new lease on life. Now, um, with that being said, what I want to do is look at, let's finish up um, Ezekiel, the 16th chapter. Let's finish that up a little bit. We want to read down to verse 8. Now, verse 7, 
I have caused thee to multiply as the bud of the field, and thou hast increased and waxen great, and thou art come to excellent ornaments. Thy breasts are fashioned, and thine hair is grown, whereas thou wast naked and bare. So now we see the birth, all right, or the rebirth of the nation of Yasharal. She's given a new beginning through this set apart word here, Kaya, which means to live. Verse 8 Now when I passed by thee and looked upon thee, behold, thy time was the time of love. And I spread my skirt over thee and covered thy nakedness. Yes, I swore unto thee and entered into a covenant, all right? Entered into a covenant with thee, saith Yahuwah Elohim, and thou becamest mine. Now, again, verse 8 speaks mad volumes, all right? There's a lot of stuff that's going on. And let's look into more about what's going on in verse 8, all right? So let me just erase this right here. We just want to make sure that there is no mis understandings on how to look at this scripture here all right there should be no miss no misses here all right the word covered in hebrew is the word kasa all right k a s a h all right kasa and the word kasa means um covered that's the word that we're looking in right now, covered. And when you look at this word, it's associated with the word canopy. All right? It's associated with the word canopy and the word throne. So when you look up in the Strong's, the word covered is the Hebrew word kasa, and, it, and it's associated with the word canopy and throne. So the point that I'm trying to make here is that Verse 8 is talking about a wedding ceremony, all right? Again, verse 8 is talking about a wedding ceremony. We have the words um, uh, kaya, which means to live. We have the word cover, which is the Hebrew word kasa. And the word canopy is associated with a wedding. A throne is also associated with a wedding. So what I'm saying is that um, Ezekiel, Yakaspuyal, the 16th chapter, is uh, um, is 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 the story of a man wooing a woman. All right, he's trying to have an intimate relationship with her, a marriage. But remember now, just like in um, Devarim, the 22nd chapter, we have a situation where this woman now committed adultery, and when a woman commits adultery, the penalty is death. So we have to make sure that we really, really are overstanding what's going on in Scripture here. I'm going to read it one more time. Verse 8. And when I passed by thee and looked upon thee, behold, thy time was the time of love. Aha. And I spread my skirt over thee and covered thy nakedness. Now again, keeping everything in context, when it says, and I covered thy nakedness, What's happening now is that this is a, this is another indicator that um, that there needs to be an atonement made for the nation of Yasharal, because here we have now the groom is covering the nakedness and the nakedness represents sin. He's covering the nakedness of the woman. And how do you cover the nakedness of a woman is by an atonement. How do you do away with or alleviate sin? There has to be a sacrifice. This is a prophetic shadow picture that the groom eventually would have to die for the bride in order to bring her back into covenant relationship again. All right. Everybody should see that. All right. I'm not adding or taking away anything from the scripture. All right. It's just that I'm trying to uh, further edify it or explain it all in one shot are we bound by contracts and i'm also showing the need for a mediator 
Yahusha HaMashiach. He's the one that's covering, all right, the nakedness. And the nakedness is representing sin. We brought out the word again, kasa, which means cover, is associated with a canopy or a hooper and a throne. These are all marital words that are used in a marriage ceremony is what I'm trying to bring out here. OK, now let's go on. All right, let's go on here. I'm going to erase this and we're going to keep on digging. Make sure. Again, there are no misunderstandings here. We want to make sure that we have a complete and thorough overstanding of what's going on here in Torah. All right. That's always the mission. Again, bear with me with the, uh, the little towel that I have here. Don't let that side track you. As long as we get the message across, that's going to be the most important part. All right. Now, the next thing that I want to talk about, all right, is the arrangements from the beginning. All right. The arrangements from the beginning. So uh, what I'm trying to say is that um, marriages were arranged. All right. From the beginning, marriages was arranged. And the groom's father, and that's very important, the groom's father made and approved the bride for the son. I'm going to say it again. The groom's father made and approved the bride for the son. Now, let's prove this from an earthly marital perspective. We're going to go to the book of Bereshit. I'm going to read 24. All right. Bereshit is the book of Genesis. Bereshit 24. And we're going to read 1 through 4. Now, Abram or Abraham was old and well stricken in age. And Yahuwah had blessed Abraham in all things. Hallelujah. And Abraham said unto his eldest servant of this house that ruled over all that he had. Put I pray thee thy hand under my thigh and I will make thee swear by Yahuwah Elohim of Shamayim and the Elohim of Aratz that thou shalt not take a Isha unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell. The Canaanites were considered a, a, a gross, detestable people. Now remember, in the book of Ezekiel, the 16th chapter, verses 1 through 8, we have a situation where the groom, Yahushua HaMashiach, is comparing the nation of Israel to these very same Canaanites who Abraham, all right, is saying, listen, don't give my son to these detestable people, all right? They, they, were, uh, they were into idolatry um, to the utmost, all right? Long story short. Now, again, but thou shalt go into my country, verse 4, but thou shalt go into my country and to my kindred and take a wife unto my son, Isaac. All right. Now, who is arranging the marriage? It's the father. All right. Abraham is given the commission to his um, his visor, his eunuch here. All right. His chamberlain. Listen, I need for you to go to my own country and get a wife for my son. So we see now that the father is arranging the marriage. Now, let's go to... Um, let's go to Bereshit, the 24th chapter. We're going to stay in the 24th chapter. We're going to go with verse 47. 47. Let's elaborate on this a little bit more. Now, we have now, um, I think this guy named here is Eliezer. All right. This is Eliezer here. Abraham's, um, accountant here all right verse 47 and i asked her we're talking about uh rachel here 
And I asked her and said, Whose daughter art thou? And she said, The daughter of Bethuel, Nahor's son, whom Melchor bared unto him. And I put the earring upon her face and the bracelet upon her hand. We're going to get back into verse 47. That is so key and detrimental, all right? We're going to go back into that a little bit later now, though. And I bowed down my head and worship Yahuwah Elohim and bless Yahuwah Elohim of my master Abraham, which he had led me, which had led me in the right way to take my master's brother's daughter into his son. Verse 49. I'm reading to the 53rd verse. And now, if you would deal kindly and truly with my master, tell me, and if not, tell me, that I may return to the right hand or to the left. Then Laban and Bethuel answered and said, The thing proceeded from Yahuwah, we cannot speak unto thee bad or good. Behold, Rebekah is before thee. Take her and go, and let her be thy master's son's wife, as Yahuwah hath spoken. And it came to pass that when Abraham's servant heard um, their words, he worshipped Yahuwah Elohim, bowing himself to the earth. And the servant brought forth jewels of um, silver and jewels of gold and raiment and gave them to Rebekah. He gave also to her brother and to her mother precious things. All right. So what I wanted to bring out here again at this stage here is called the betrothal period. All right. They did not consummate the marriage yet, but she agreed. OK, by accepting the gifts. And that was also another custom that we did is that um, we gave gifts to the Isha, the potential Isha and to the family, letting us know or letting the family know that, you know what, we wanted to make good on this promise here. So, again, overstanding Hebrew customs and culture is going to be very, very important. All right. So, again, this is the, uh, the betrothal uh, period. This means now that she's considered for all intents and purposes. Now, she's considered married. All right. She's considered married. Now, to prove this, let's go back to verse um, 47. This is 2447. And I, I, and I asked her and said, whose daughter art thou? And she said, the daughter of Bethel, Nahor's son, and Milcah bared unto him. And I put the earring upon her face and the bracelet upon her hand. These are betrothal ornaments. All right. Let me say it again. These are betrothal ornaments ornaments that you give a woman all right to show that you're interested in marrying her now i just brought out all of this now from a earthly perspective on how a man deals with a potential mate now let's look at this from um a spiritual perspective all right on how the groom yahushua hamashiach deals with his bride all right let's look at that let's go to uh back to the book of ezekiel the 16th chapter verse 9 through 14 all right 9 through 14 and remember now uh ezekiel the 16th chapter verse 9 remember that let's see we have Yakaskoyal, the ninth chapter, and I'm going to read down to the 14th verse. Then watched I you with water. So we see now again the importance of a mikvah, an immersion. These are wedding ceremonial procedures. All right, again, it says, then watched I, you, the nation of Yasharal, with water. Yes, I thoroughly washed away thy blood from thee, and I anointed thee with oil. And this is what happens with an immersion. You go into the water, okay, and that old you dies in the water. Now, there's a lot of different procedures 
with emergent, and I'm not here to knock any procedure. But I personally, and I'm going to say it here, this is my disclaimer, I'm not mocking anybody's immersion. But immersion should be done free will. A free will submission, meaning this, is that the person goes into the water on their own accord, all right? And the person now goes totally underneath the water without the assistance of anybody else. This lets you know that this was uh, a decision um, made by the individual and you're not being persuaded or anything. Nobody's forcing you down in the water. Nobody is guiding you down into the water. You are literally doing everything on your own and you're going down completely underneath the water and you're coming back up. And then we have here, verse 9 again, Then wash I you with water. Yes, I thoroughly washed away thy blood from thee, and I anointed thee with oil. So when a person comes back up, the person is now kaya, lived. The person now resurrected. This is now um, the new beginning or the new lease on the person's life. All right? And again, I am not criticizing or ridiculing anybody's uh, immersion. But I just like the whole thing about the free will thing, all right? You're going underneath on your own accord. You're being anointed with oil. Um, kaya, live. This is your new lease on life, all right? Verse 10. I clothed thee also with broadened work and showed or clothed thee with badger skin. I girded thee with fine linen and I covered thee with silk. Verse 11. I decked thee also with ornaments, and I put bracelets upon thy hand, and a chain on thy neck, and I put a jewel on thy forehead, and earrings in thy ears, and a beautiful crown, a beautiful crown upon thy head. Thou was decked with gold and silver, and thy raiment was of fine linen and silk, and brought it work. Thou didst eat fine flour and honey and oil. There are some people who say, hey, listen, you know what? You're not supposed to eat honey. But here we have here now that the scripture is using honey. So it can't be an abomination. It is okay to eat honey. I just want to throw that in there. Um, and broader work, thou didst eat fine flour and honey and oil. And thou was exceedingly beautiful and didst prosper into a kingdom. And thy renown went forth among the heathen for thy beauty, for it was perfect through the through my or Yahushua Hamashiach's comeliness, which I had put upon thee, saith Yahuwah Elohim. So what is verses nine through fourteen talking about? I said not to forget what was going on in the book of Bereshit, um, the twenty fourth chapter, verse uh, I think it was verse. Uh, let's see, it was verse. Let's go back to it. It was verse four where we see now where it wasn't verse four. It was verse 47 where we see now where Eliezer is giving Rachel earrings, bracelets. Now, and, and this earring of um, a part of face where uh, women wore um, like a piece of jewel um, in like in the middle of her forehead and it wrapped all the way around. So this was also um, an attire that um, Israelites is like women wore. But what I'm saying here is that these are wedding apparels. Again, this is wedding apparel. So I brought forth now the parallel with an earthly marriage. And then we went to the spiritual marriage between the groom and the nation of Israel. And the same gifts that were given to Rachel, all right, was given to the nation of Israel. All right, just take the time and read it again. Genesis, the 24th chapter, verses 47 to 50, uh, 53. And we're reading now the spiritual aspects of it. Ezekiel, the 16th chapter, verses 9 through 14. It's the very same thing. All right, the very same thing. Remember, we are Hebrews, we have a culture, and it is best, I believe, to get the know, excuse me, to get to know the culture as much as you can because you want to walk that way. This makes you quadushin. This makes you set apart. This shows that you are 
betrothed. You in the that you are in the betrothal stage of the marriage. All right. This is where we're at today. Again, Yasharal, we are in the betrothal part of the marriage. All right. When does the intimate part come? The intimate part comes in the seventh month. In the seventh month, it's um, more particular now in the, the seventh month, the 15th day of that month to the 21st, where we have what we call um, the Feast of Sukkot, where now we have the groom tabernacling with the bride. And then remember now, like I said with the number eight, the number eight represents new beginnings. Then after, from the 15th to the 21st, we have that the nation of Yashar is supposed to stay another day. And that was called Shemini Atzeret, which means the eighth day. And the eighth represents Kaya, a new beginning. All right. So that should be pretty simple. All right. Now, um, let's go a little bit further. Let's go to the book of Yahukanan or the book of John 644. Okay. 644. We're going to the Brit Hadashah. We're going to 644. Let's see what we got at 644 here. And we're proving here now again that the Father sets the stage. The Father um, picks the bride for the Son. Let's see how, you, uh, how Yehusha HaMashiach is going to um, handle that situation. For the groom says this, no man can come to me except the father which have sent me draw him and I will raise him up in the last day. See what just happened here? The father sets the stage. The father is Yahuwah. The son is Yahushua HaMashiach. I said earlier in the book of Bereshit, the 24th chapter, at that particular junction, Abraham was the father, preparing a bride for his son, Isaac. Now look at the spiritual part of it. We went to Ezekiel, the 16th chapter. We now in Yahukanan, the 6th chapter, verse 44, who's preparing the marriage? It's Yahuwah. He's preparing the marriage for his son. So again, when we begin to look at parallels, you truly, really believe that there is no such thing as the Messiah? There is still no need for a mediator? How are brothers and sisters reading Bereshit, the first chapter, when it talks about in the beginning, you have the olive top, he's building a house. Building a house for who? We have the groom building a house for somebody to dwell in and those people from the beginning who were supposed to live in that house was the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel was the bride from the very beginning. The nation of Israel is the Rashi. She is the beginning. She is first fruits, just as Yahushua HaMashiach is first fruits. How can we miss? How can we really miss here if we really truly believe parallels? That's all we have to do. Again, 644. No man can come to the groom, Yahushua HaMashiach, except the Father, which have sent me, draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Raise him up at the last day for what? Raise him up at the last day for the marriage. For the marriage. From Genesis to Revelation, this is all talking about reconciling the difference. And the watchman's responsibility is to make sure that the bride is ready. That's my responsibility. That's your responsibility as watchmen of the faith. That's your responsibility. Let's go on here, all right? Let's go to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians here, and we're going to go 11. 
We're going to go 11, 1 through 3. Let's see what Shaul has to say here. What to Elohim you could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with a righteous jealousy. So this is the type of love that Shaul had. And this type of love wasn't excluded only to Shaul. All of the prophets had this type of love. For the messenger, Yahushua HaMashiach, sending out his Talmudim, and his Talmudim had this jealousy, this type of love for the sheep. Watch this. For I am jealous over you with a, uh, with a righteous jealousy, for I have espoused, espoused, we're talking about quadushin, betrothal, you to one or to a husband. The question is, is, who was that husband? See, this explains our ministry. When I do my YouTube shows, when I do my lectures, um, when I come across anybody, my goal now is to espouse this individual to one husband, Yahushua HaMashiach, bringing us back into covenant relationship again with who? Both the Father and the Son. Because it's the Father, all right, that sends the Son. Okay, or who prepares the Son, all right, for marriage. The marriages were prearranged by the Father. For I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to a Mashiach. A chaste virgin to Hamashiach. Now, let's go to the book of Revelations. The book of Revelation, let's go uh, 21. 21, yes, 21, 1 through 2. Look at this allegory here, which is actually real, okay? It's an allegory plus it's, 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 this is an actual event. And I saw a new Shamayim, or a new heaven, and a new Arat, so a new earth, for the first heaven and the first Arats were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, Yehuchanan, saw the set-apart city, New Jerusalem, coming down from Elohim out of Shamayim, prepared as a bride, prepared as a bride, adorned for her groom. See the parallels here? This is all about preparing for a marriage. The father prepares the marriage. Okay? And so again, I just want to make sure that we clearly understand, okay? Contracts were made in Israel and that's where we're going to go into next, okay? So it takes a little bit more than just going into the woman, all right? There was a procedure that was done that actually consummated the whole thing, all right? Now, let's look at the groom's responsibility, all right? That's the next topic, the groom's responsibility. And that's right, men. We have a responsibility as grooms to our Ishas, all right? Just as the groom, Yahushua HaMashiach, has a responsibility to his bride. Now, the groom makes a covenant or a contract of promise. I'm going to say it again. The groom's responsibility is this. The groom makes a covenant or a contract promise called a ketubah. A ketubah is a contract. It's a list of things that the bride must abide by. It's a contract. So it's not as simple as just going into the woman. All right. There must be a written contract and it's called a ketubah. Now, this ketubah assures the bride that she will be provided for 
After both parties agree to the terms, the contract becomes binding. The contract becomes binding. The couple was considered married, even though the intimate act of relations didn't occur yet. Now, let's look at this on its earthly principles first, all right? Let's go to the book of Tobit, all right? The book of Tobit, T-O-B-I-T. -T. And we're going to go with the seventh chapter, all right? This is in your Apocrypha. Let's see. Seven. And we're going to read from eight to 18, all right? Eight to 18. Um, you actually have to read the whole book of Tobit. It's, it's a beautiful book, all right? Um, but because of time, you know, I'm going to have to um, pick and choose because I just want to bring up the main topics here. Now, and likewise, Etna, his wife, Etna, his wife, and Sarah, his daughter, wept. Moreover, they entertained them cheerfully, and after they had killed a ram, of the flock, they set store of meat on the table. Now, this is where it gets interesting at. This is where I really wanted to start at. Then said Tobias to Raphael. Raphael is a messenger. So he's a malach of Yahuwah. Then said Tobias to Raphael, brother Azarias, Azarias is Raphael. Speak of those things on which thou didst, in which thou didst talk in the way, and let this business be dispatched. So he communicated the matter with Ragul, and Ragul said to Tobias, Eat and drink and make merry, for it is meet that thou shouldest marry my daughter. So it is good that thou should marry my daughter. Her daughter the daughter's name was Sarah. Nevertheless, I would declare unto you the truth. I have given my daughter in marriage to seven men who died that night that came in unto her. Nevertheless, for uh, the present, be merry. But Tobiah said, I will eat nothing here till we agree and swear one to another. Ragul said, take her from henceforth according to the law, for thou art her cousin, and she is thine, and, excuse me, and the merciful Yahuwah give you good success in all things. We'll get into that a little bit later, okay, because um, keeping bloodline and if a son married his father's brother's daughter, that is lawful in Israel, all right? That is lawful. This is how you kept things in order, all right? Um, and I get into that a little bit later, all right? Because a lot of people look at that as um, the grotesque and how can you do that? That's incest. That's not incest, all right? But we'll get into that a little bit later. Ragul said, take her from henceforth according to the manner, for thou art her cousin, and she is thine. For the merciful Yahuwah give you good success in all things. Then he called his daughter Sarah, and she came to her father, and, her, and he took her by the hand and gave her to be wife to Tobias. Now, this is the quadrucian stage, the betrothal stage, but she's still considered a wife. She can't go out and um, intermingle um, sexually or in any type of intimate way with any other man. Here in Western society, a woman can say, well, listen, you know what? Um, I want to make a choice. So what I want to do is I want to go out with Tom, Dick, and Harry, Bob, Bill, Joe, Hank, Frank, and, and, and Tom. Nine different guys. And I want to try out all nine guys. All right? And out of the nine guys, I'm going to decide who's the best, and then I'll marry that guy. That's Western um, Greco-Roman um, ideology. That's how they do it here. But we have our own custom, all right? We don't do that in Yashiral, all right? You don't get the chance to dib and dabble and stuff like that. You, you, you don't do that. That's considered a whore, all right? So let's be clear of that. 
Uh, Behold, take her after the law of Moshe and lead her away to thy father and be Baruch. And he Baruch them. And he called Etna his wife and took paper, contract, all right? And called Etna his wife and took paper and did write an instrument of covenants and sealed it. So should weddings be bound by contracts? In case I was going too fast, let's read it again. And Ragul called Etna his wife and took paper and did write an instrument of covenants and sealed it. Then they began to eat and Ragal called his wife Etna and said it to her sister. Wives were also called sister. I can call my Isha sister. All right. Abraham called Sarah his sister. Prepare a prepare another chamber and bring her in thither. When she had gone as he had bidden her, she brought her um, there and she wept and she received or she licked the tears of her daughter and said unto her, Be of comfort, my daughter, for Yahuwah of Elohim, for Yahuwah Elohim of Shamaim and Aratz, give thee joy for for this thy sorrow. Be of be of good countenance, my um, daughter. Now another sign of a contract, if the woman was never intimate with another man, okay, uh, the family will wait outside of the hooper. Um, the man will already be inside of the hooper. The woman, on, on, on her own accord, excuse me, on her own accord, will go inside of the hooper. I, I know this sounds <laughs> less intimate, but let's keep Hebrew culture, all right? There's nothing freaky about it. But what happened now is that the woman would go into the hooper and they would commence in the act of sex, all right? And the contract would be. Uh, if she was a virgin, um, the blood on the sheets. All right. So this was given to the father and this was a contract that, you know what, you've humbled my daughter. Um, here is the proof. And it's a contract. All right. So contracts were made in Yasharal. This is the point that I'm trying to make here. All right. So let's go to some more scriptures to try to um, Pull this out, okay, because I'm running um, out of time here. I'm going to speed this up a little bit. Um, now let's see how this parallels to our marriage to the groom, Yahushua HaMashiach. Let's go to uh, the book of Shemot, the 20th chapter. The book of Shemot, the 20th chapter. Let's leave no stones unturned here. Let's talk about the Ketubah, all right? Let's go, I'm going to read verses 1 through 7, okay? Verse chapter 20 is a ketubah, written on stone. And Elohim spoke all these words, saying to the bride, I am Yahuwah Elohim, or Yahuwah your Elohim, which I brought thee out of the land of Mizraim, out of the house of bondage. Verse 7, I'm going to skip around a little bit. These are the terms of the marriage. Thou shalt not take the literal name of Yahuwah, thy um, Elohim, in vain. Now, it is very important for the groom and the bride to have a relationship. The bride must know the name of the party she's marrying. There's a lot of people who are saying that it doesn't matter, okay? And we can call the groom by any name. My argument is this. How can you get married and not know the groom's name? My argument is this. I'm not I'm not uh, worried about I'm not talking about tones, all right? But the name of the groom is Yahuwah. All right? Is Yahuwah. Now the son's name is Yahusha. And we know now that Yahuwah emptying himself into a vessel all right, Yahushua HaMashiach, and we know now that Yahushua HaMashiach is, all, is, is just proclaiming all of the words of the Father. But again, let me just make sure that I don't want to uh, confuse anybody. The groom is Yahushua, the Father is Yahuwah, but they're, they're one, 
Okay, I get into that a little bit later. I don't want to confuse the situation. But the point that I wanted to bring out is that thou shalt not take the name of Yahuwah, um, thy mighty one, in vain. That means the literal name, and this also means in character. All right? You can't have one without the other. You can't blaspheme the name, the literal name of um, the groom, and you should not walk in a disrespectful character that also defiles the name. Verse um, 7 again. For Yahuwah will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Remember the Shabbat day to keep it set apart. Uh, let's read down to verse 11. For in six days Yahuwah made Shamayim and Arats and the sea and all that is in them and rested the seventh day. Seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The Shabbat doesn't bounce around. That seventh day is set apart. So from your first seven, you count another seven. That's a Shabbat. Another seven, that's a Shabbat. And another seven, that's a Shabbat. All right? Um, for six days, um, Yahuwah made Shamayims and the earth and the sea and all in them and rested the seventh day where for Yahuwah blessed the Shabbat and set it apart. All right. So again, I just want to bring out the fact or the points of a contract. Exodus, the 20th chapter is called the Ketubah. It's a contract. Now, let's go to the next script. Let's go to Shemot 31. Shemot 31, 15 through 18. 15 to 18. Six days may work be done, but in the seventh it is, it is a Shabbat of rest, set apart unto Yahuwah. Whosoever doeth any work in the Shabbat day, he shall surely be put to death. This is all the stipulations, the rules and regulations in the Ketubah. All right? Wherefore, the children of Yashara shall keep the Shabbat to observe the Shabbat throughout your generations for a perpetual covenant. Perpetual, olam, forever, it, it, it literally means that, all right? It is a sign, it is a oath, a sign between me and the children of Yashara, olam. For in six days, Yahuwah made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day, he rested and was refreshed. Hallelujah. And he gave unto Moses when he had made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai two tables of testimony, tablets of stone written with the finger of Elohim. This is a contract. This contract was written in stone. Written in stone. This, Yasharal, is considered a contract. All right? A contract. Now, let's go a little bit more, all right? Let's go to Deborahim. Let's go to Deborahim 24. We're almost done. Deborahim 24, uh, 1 through 2. When a man have taken a wife, a Isha, and married her, and it come to pass that she find no favor in his eyes because he had found some uncleanness in her or nakedness in her which is sin in her then let him write her write her write her okay a bill of divorcement and give it in her hand and send her out of his house i brought that up because everything that was done in israel was done through contracts everything land property servants marriage everything was edified through contracts all of it so i don't um i'm not an advocate of people saying hey listen i went into the isha boom that's my isha um, but we're married and i don't need any type of written um decree i i don't believe that i believe that you need a written decree based upon these scriptures that i'm bringing out here all right so try to get that written um agreement okay between um the male and the female the isha and the isha so that everybody knows their responsibility on how they must conduct themselves um in a marriage all right that's gonna be very important 
Um, let's go to the book of Romans, the seventh chapter. The book of Romans, seven, 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 seven. This is just one of my favorite scripts here. Seven. Know you not, brethren, for I speak to them that know Torah. Torah is law. <laughs> That's the law. It's a written contract. How that the law have dominion over a man as long as he live. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law or the contract or Torah. Torah is a contract that was given to the nation of Israel. Bound by law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loose from the Torah or the contract of her husband. So then if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. And this is what's going on with the nation of Yasharal. All right. The nation of Yasharal was considered an adulterous woman. She was considered a whore. She was considered a mistress woman. When we go to Ezekiel, the 16th chapter, 1 through 4, when we see where the groom is using derogatory terms towards his Isha, she committed adultery. The man is still alive. And we're going to show now through prophetic shadow pictures and through parallels that this is all pertaining to Yahusha Hamashiach the groom. All right. This is getting so simple, so easy now. So then if her husband liveth, she married to another man, she should be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from the contract so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Now, we see now where I talked about in the book of Ezekiel, where um, the groom covered Kassa, her sins, her nakedness. How this is an atonement. How are atonements made? In the word that I didn't get a chance to go into was the word um, covenant. It was the Hebrew word breit, which means a cutting, and we it, it, which represents blood. So there has to be a blood sacrifice. All of the lambs that were killed, all of the bullocks that were killed, that um, for atoning sacrifices, it has to do with the blood. We're concentrating on the blood. All right. So that was a quick, short version of that there. Okay, I'm going to have to speed it up here a little bit. Verse 4. Wherefore, my brethren, you also are become dead to the law, the penalty of the law, because Israel was in sin. All right? Where it says you will also become dead to the law. It's not talking about dead to Torah, but the penalty that occurred for breaking the law. By the body of Yahushua HaMashiach, that you should be married. These terms again, married. These are, this is all about marriage. That you should be married to another, even to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto Elohim. All right. That's self-explanatory idea. Now, uh, what I want to talk about, two more, two more things. This is going to be real quick. The groom prepares a place for his bride. So what I'm talking about so far, all right, is the groom's responsibility. Um, the groom makes a covenant or a contract or a promise um, to his Isha. The groom prepares a place for his bride. I'm going to say it again. The groom prepares the place for the bride. All right. I'm, everybody's circumstances is, 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 is different. All right. I'm an advocate of the man being the provider. I'm an advocate of the man working and providing. And I do um, overstand now. The, the curse that we're under based upon Deborah Rain, the 28th chapter, where now both the man and the woman has to work in order to provide. All right. So uh, but again, um, everybody gets sick. We lose our jobs and so forth and everything like that. But I do believe that the man should be bringing in some type of monetary gain um, to, to the house. I'm not an advocate of him not working or bringing some type of uh, monies to the house. All right. Um, that's just my whole thing there. And I'm going to show that in scripture. The groom prepares a place for the bride. Um, the groom prepares the bridal chamber for his bride and the groom prepares it. And he, the groom prepares it. Um, and if it pleases the father of Yahuwah, then the father says, okay, then it's now time for you to get the bride. So again, the groom prepares the bridal chamber. The father inspects the bridal chamber. And if it's conducive to the father's wishes, then the groom 
gets the permission from the father to fetch or go get, retrieve his Isha. All right, let's prove that. Um, let's go to the book of Acts. The book of Acts, the first chapter. One, the first chapter, and read 5 to 11. For you who cannot truly baptize or immerse with water, but you shall be immersed with the set apart spirit not many days hence. Listen to verse 6. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, Yahushua HaMashiach, saying, Will thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Yasharal? We're talking about restoration here. We're talking about northern kingdom and southern kingdom. Are you now at this time going to put the bride back in her proper place? Okay, we're talking about this bridal chamber here. Watch this. And he said unto them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the father have put in his own power, but you shall receive power after that the set of spirit has come upon you and you shall be witness unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in, in Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. Now, the point that I wanted to bring out is that Yahushua HaMashiach is saying that, listen, you know what? Um, this restoration is in the Father's hand. We see that the Messiah said, listen, I go to prepare a place for you. But the time of the marriage is based upon the Father. In the meanwhile, the groom is preparing a place for the groom. The Father comes, he inspects the bridal chamber. Okay, all right. He sends the son, the son goes and gets his bride, brings the bride back into the bridal chamber. They commence, they're now husband and wife, all right? But again, right now we're in the betrothal period. Let me just read that again, make sure that nobody is misunderstanding what I'm saying. And so when the Talmudin of Yahushua HaMashiach asked him about the restoration of the kingdom of Israel, his response was this, and he said it to them, it is not for you to know the time or the season which the father had put in his own power. So everything is based upon the will of Yahuwah. When Yahuwah says, okay, the bride, excuse me, the groom goes and gets his bride. All right, let's use some, let's go to some other scriptures to um, back that up. Yahuqanan. Yohukanan um, 14, 14, um, was this the one? Yeah, 14, 1 through 4. Let not your heart be troubled, you that believe in Elohim, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, and we break down the whole thing with mansions and houses a little bit later, all right? We're going to read it as it is here now. In my father's house, there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. I go to prepare a place for you. Now, when you go back now to the book of Acts, the first chapter, he says that this sending again of the groom is in the father's hands. Now, while it's in the father's hands, all right, the groom is preparing a place for the bride. Read it again. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would not have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. He's going to prepare a place for the bride. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will. I will. I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. And whether I go, you know, in the way you know, which is to follow Torah. So in order to be part of this relationship, because the groom is going to prepare this place, and you know how to get there, the way that you get there, and the way that you're acceptable to the groom is to follow Torah. That's all what that's saying there. All right? Um, now, while the groom is away preparing the bridal chamber, all right, what is the 
bride's responsibility, all right? Now, when the groom builds the new home, the bride waits for the return of the groom by remaining in Torah. Torah is her wedding gown, all right? Again, Torah is her wedding gown. And just like I brought out before in the wisdom um, of, of Solomon is that we don't want to be like that woman that slept. All right. When the groom came to get the bride, the woman was asleep and she had taken off her garment, meaning that she was not following Torah. She was asleep. We have now the groom knocking on the door, asking or inviting the woman to come outside to have this relationship, but the bride is saying, listen, I've taken off my garments. How can I put them back on now? So in other words, what I'm saying now is that you, you know, we all know the parable about um, the 10 virgins. Five were wise, five were unwise. The five that were not wise did not have enough oil in their lamps. Meaning this is that he that endureth until the end shall be saved. The other five were not able to endure to the end. And another parable is that, you know, I sowed good seeds, some on stony ground. They began to take root and grow up. But guess what? Um, being that they didn't actually take root and it was on um, not moist soil, a good earth. Guess what happened? They wasn't able to um, hold on when a storm came. So when Christianity came, when Egyptology came, when Buddhism came, all these other different religions came, all right, this wind blew by, okay, this 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 branch, it, it fell over. But if you but if you plant your seeds on good ground, when all these other doctrines come your way, you will be able to stand firm in the words of Yahuwah because you've planted or you've gotten root in good ground. All right. So we all know that parable there. But again, while the groom is away preparing the bridal chamber, the bride must stay in Torah. Now, let's go to 2 Corinthians. We only have two more scriptures here, Yasharal, and we are done. All right, we're done. 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 11, 11, 11, 11. 2 Corinthians 11 and 2. 11 and 2. Actually, we went through that one. Uh, but again, let's read it again. For I am jealous over you with an, uh, a righteous jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Yahushua HaMashiach. And so again, our responsibility, okay, is to make sure that we stay in consistency with Torah. All right. That's going to be very important. Let's now go to the last scripture on the book of Luke. The book of Luke and the ninth chapter. The ninth chapter, Luke 9. Luke 9, and we're going to start with the ninth verse. Luke, excuse me, Luke 19, excuse me, Luke 19, Luke 19, Luke 19, 9 to 27, and Yahushua HaMashiach said unto them, this day is salvation come to this house, I'm going to read it again, and Yahushua said unto him, this day is salvation come to this house. For so much as he also is the son of Abraham. Verse 10. For the son of man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. So this is talking about the nation of Yasharal. And as they heard these things, he added and spoke a parable because he was near to Jerusalem, And because they thought that the kingdom of Elohim would immediately appear. He said, therefore... Listen to this parable. A certain noble man went into a far country. He's going into this far country, okay, to prepare a place. He goes to this far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. 
This is all pertaining to the Messiah. All right. And he called his 10 servants. All right. And delivered them 10 pounds. And said to them, occupy or stay here till I come. Now, these servants, we're going to say that they're watchmen. And the responsibility of the watchman is to guard the sheep, to make to have that that that, um, that righteous love over the sheep where you're preparing them to meet the um, the groom. That's my responsibility. That's all of our responsibilities. All right. Those of us that are studied well enough in Torah is to teach, to minister the words of Yahuwah preparing the bride to meet the groom. This is what this whole thing is about. Verse 10. But his citizens, we're talking about those of Israel, his, but his citizens hated him and sent a messenger after him saying, we would not have this man to reign over us. They, those that are saying that are those who don't believe in the Messiah. They don't believe in the Messiah. So they're saying, and they sent a message after saying, we will not have that this man reign over us. And it came to pass that when he was returned, which is the Messiah, having received the kingdom, which is the Messiah, then he commanded those servants to be called unto him, to whom he had given the money. And the money is going to be just simply the, the Torah, all right, the Torah that he might know how much every man have gained by trading. Then came the first saying, Elohim, thy pound have given 10 pounds. So there was an increase. Meaning this is that those of us that know Torah, it's not, it's good that you just, that you teach a family, but you also need to take it a step further and go out and, and, and teach abroad. OK, because you want this increase and in just keeping this isolated to just one individual is not going to make it because the father gave you a talent. And at, at his return, he wants to see an increase in what he gave you. The scriptures is all about increase. All right. Let's show that. And it came to pass that when he was returned, being received the kingdom, then he commanded these servants, he called to them to whom he had given the money that he might know how much every man had gained by trading, gained by trading. Then came the first saying, Elohim, thy pound have gained 10 pounds. And he said unto him, well, thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful in very little, thou have thou authority over 10 cities. And the second came saying, Elohim, thy pound have gained thee five pounds. And he said, likewise to him, be thou also over five cities. And another came saying, Elohim, behold, here is thy pound, which I have kept laid in an arm in a napkin. He done nothing with it. For I fear thee, because thou art an ossery man, thou takest up that thou laidest not down, in reapest that thou didst not sow. And he said unto him, this is Yahushua HaMashiach, out of thy own mouth will I judge thee, thou wicked servant. Thou knewest that I was an um, osiree man, taken up that I laid not down, and reaping that I did not sow. Wherefore, then givest not thou my money, excuse me, Wherefore, then givest not thou my money into thy hands, that at my coming I may have required my own with usury? This is a question. He said, he's, and he said unto them that stood by, Take him the pound, and give it to him that have ten pounds. And they said unto him, Yahuwah, he have ten pounds. Verse 26, For I say unto you, that unto every one which have shall be given and from him that have not even that he have shall be taken away from him verse 27 
all those okay that are like this lazy servant that don't want the you uh, that don't want the messiah to reign over them listen to what the messiah has to say but those my enemies which would not that i should reign over them bring them hither and slay them before me all right so this is how critical this walk is becoming all right we have to acknowledge the mediator all right which is yahushua hamashiach he is the groom sent by the father the groom goes to prepare a place the groom has a contract the uh, groom a Tony sacrifice was it was his blood and he's coming back okay to pick up the product that he purchased and the product that he purchased was his bride the nation of Yasharal all right so in final contracts were done in Israel I suggest that you have a ketubah written all right to consummate this whole situation properly all right and if there's any questions regarding anything that I'm saying please leave um, a message and I get back to you at my earliest convenience but Yasharal again um, it's a pleasure doing these shows here and um, I pray that I be back with you real soon and with that I say Shalom <laughs>